Welcome to 929 Chapters. I'm your host, David Z. Moster, PhD and Rabbi, and today I am very excited to be talking about this. The Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, one of the most important scholarly Bibles out there, used by scholars to study both the history of the text of the Hebrew Bible and also something called the Masoretic Notes, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Today's video will be broken up into three parts. It will begin with an introduction to the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. Then I'm going to show you what a page looks like in this book and how to use the different parts of the page. And then finally what I'll do is show you a few case studies so you can see why and how the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia is so important. Just a note before we begin. The Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, which I'll call BHS from now on, is a Hebrew Bible, which means there's no English translation. Now, even if you know a little bit of Hebrew, you don't necessarily need to know a lot, but just a little bit, this book can be incredibly useful to you and your Bible study. And I will show you how to really use this book, even if you're not an expert in Hebrew itself. Okay, let's begin with the introduction. BHS is the fourth Bible in a series of Hebrew Bibles put out by the Deutsche Bibelgesellschaft which means the German Bible Society in Stuttgart, Germany. It was put out between 1968 and 1977, and in 1977 it finally came out in one full volume. The BHS is based on the Leningrad Codex, from the years 1008 to 1010, written in Cairo, Egypt. Now the Leningrad Codex is important because it's the oldest complete Hebrew Bible. From beginning to end, it's all there. It was copied by one person, Shmuel ben Yaakov, who was a mastery. What that means is that he was a Jewish scribe whose main goal was to preserve the Hebrew biblical texts. The main goal was to make sure that when copyists were copying one biblical text to create another one, that no errors crept in while they were working. And these errors could have come for a number of reasons. They could have come because the original manuscript was all smudged and it was hard to read. They could have come because the copyist accidentally omitted something. Or they could have come because the copyist accidentally inserted something. The Masoretes, their main job was to try and ensure that that didn't happen. The way they did that was by adding notes to the biblical text on the side. And you can see these here in the Leningrad Codex itself. These are called Masoretic Notes or Mesorah Notes or simply Mesorah. In Hebrew, the word Mesorah means tradition. These were the notes that were passed down from scribe to scribe. So the Leningrad Codex is also important because it has a full set of these Mesorah notes. Now the Masoretes came about sometime in the first millennium of the Common Era, and you might be wondering, why would such a guild, such a group have to come about? And the answer is, it's kind of simple. In the ancient world, anytime someone copied one manuscript to the other, there were going to be mistakes or variants. Now, these variants can sometimes be small, even one letter, or sometimes a little larger, one word, sometimes even bigger, a few verses, and sometimes, especially in ancient, ancient manuscripts, even entire paragraphs could have been added or omitted. So, the mass reads came about to say, hey, let's preserve the biblical text as it is. And the text that they came to preserve has been called the Masoretic Bible. So the Hebrew Bible that we know and use today is actually a Masoretic Bible. There were other Bibles with some variants, especially in the ancient world. And this brings us to BHS, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. What the BHS is going to do is going to explain to you where the Leningrad Codex differs from other Hebrew Bibles, those could be Masoretic Bibles, or even non-Masoretic Bibles from the ancient world, such as the Septuagint Greek translation, such as Jerome's Latin Vulgate, such as the Targums, the Jewish Targum translations into Aramaic, or even something called the Samaritan Pentateuch, which we'll be looking at today. So let's move on to the next part, looking at a page of the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. So we're looking at page 17 of the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, which puts us in the book of Genesis at the end of the 11th chapter and the beginning of the 12th chapter. Now right in the center we have the main text of the Leningrad Codex, and as we mentioned before, this is the oldest complete Hebrew Bible text out there that we know of. At the side, we have the small Mesorah notes, and right below the text, we have the large Mesorah notes. And as I mentioned, these will be discussed in the next video, how to use the Mesorah notes of the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. Now, at the bottom, what we're looking at is what is called the scholarly or critical apparatus. Now, this is the most important thing for us today. 
What the apparatus is going to do is going to tell us where there are important variants for each and every word. If there's an important variant, they're going to mention it below. Now this apparatus tells us a lot of information in a very short amount of time and space. The way it does that is by using Latin words abbreviated and also symbols for manuscripts. So in order to understand this apparatus, we need to know the Latin words that are used and the symbols for the manuscripts that are used. So luckily, at the beginning of the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, there are two keys. The first key, titled Sigla et Compendia Apparatum, this is going to tell you all of the symbols used for each and every manuscript. The second key for us is called an English and German key to the Latin words and abbreviations and the symbols of Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. This key does exactly what it says it does. It tells you all of the Latin words and abbreviations and what they mean in English. Okay, so we've introduced the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. We now know that it's based on the Leningrad Codex and why the Leningrad Codex is so important. We also now know what's on each and every page of the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. So now what we're going to do is look at a number of case studies so that I can demonstrate how and why the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia is so important for our understanding of the biblical text. Our first case study is going to be Genesis chapter 47. In Genesis 47, the people of Egypt find themselves in very dire straits. There is a severe famine in the land. And the only person who has food is Joseph, the viceroy of Pharaoh, because Joseph has been saving up food for seven years. In the first year of the famine, the people go to Joseph and pay him all of their money. When that's not enough, they give him all of their animals. They come back in the second year and they give him all of their land because they have no more money and no more animals. And in the second year, they also offer up their bodies to be slaves to Joseph and to Pharaoh, just so they can eat. In the middle of the second year, when the people are giving over themselves as slaves, we have a very odd phrase in the Hebrew text of the Leningrad Codex. It says, The Etaam and the people ha'evir oto arim. Joseph passed them into the cities. Now, what does it mean he passed them into the cities? First of all, there's no real reason for him to pass anyone into a city. And second of all, just in the next few verses, we are told that the people will be working their fields. So if they're working the fields, then why are they in the cities? It just doesn't make sense. So here I have the BHS on my computer, and we can see that there's two little letter A's. So we go to the bottom, and we see on verse 21, in between the two A's, and here we have these Latin words, which we now know the translations for from our Latin key, we should be reading according to the Samaritan Pentateuch. That little squiggly means the Samaritan Pentateuch, and the G stands for the Greek Septuagint, which we'll get to in our next case study. So what do we see in the Samaritan Pentateuch? The words, ha'avid oto la'avadim. He enslaved them to become slaves. So Joseph wasn't bringing people into cities, according to the Samaritan Pentateuch. He was enslaving them as slaves of Pharaoh. Now, a little background information about the Samaritan Pentateuch. The Samaritan Pentateuch is the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, that belongs and is used by the Samaritans, a group of people who claim descent from the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph, and call themselves the Shomrim, the keepers, the keepers of tradition. The earliest full manuscripts of the Samaritan Pentateuch come from the 12 to 1300s, but even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can find texts that we call Proto-Samaritan, meaning they agree very much with the Samaritan text that came after it. Here we're looking at 4Q22. This means that it's from the fourth cave at Qumran, and it's the 22nd scroll that was published, and it in many ways agrees with the text of the Samaritan Pentateuch, the one that we know from the 12 and 1300s. Now, with this background knowledge, let's return to our three words in Genesis 47:21. The Masoretic text has he'evir oto la'arim. Joseph passed these people into cities. Now notice that I highlighted the letters resh. Resh is like the R in English, ra. Now the Samaritan Pentateuch is identical, except for those two reshes actually become dalids, duds. So instead of he'evir oto la'arim, it's he'evid oto la'avadim. He enslaved them to become slaves. And the Samaritan Pentateuch has one more difference, is there's an extra letter compared to the Masoretic text, and that's the bet in orange here. The way that we can explain how these variants came about is something called the Dalit and Resh interchange. The Dalit and Resh interchange basically means that these two letters, Dalit and Resh, look so similar in Hebrew that they are often confused by scribes. So let's take a look at the Dalit and Resh in a number of ancient Hebrew scripts. 
In Paleo Hebrew, the oldest form of Hebrew, what we see is the Dalet on the left looks identical to the Resh on the right, except that the Resh has a longer leg. In the Samaritan texts, the Dalet on the left looks identical to the Resh on the right, except that the Dalet has a little protrusion in its top right corner. In the Aramaic type script of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see the Dalet on the left looks very similar to the Resh on the right, except that the Dalet again has a protrusion in its top right corner. And then finally, when we get to the Leningrad Codex in the year 1008 to 1010, we see the Dalet on the left looks identical to the Resh on the right, except it's hard to tell, but the Dalet has a very minor protrusion in its top right corner. Now that we know about the dalit resh interchange, we can explain what's going on here in Genesis 47, verse 21. The original text of Genesis probably said that Joseph was enslaving the people as slaves. This makes the most sense given the context of the chapter. Then, somewhere along the way, a scribe accidentally understood ha'evid oto la'avadim as ha'evir oto la'arim because the Dalit and Resh are so similar. Now, it doesn't explain everything. The bet, we're not sure where that got lost along the way, but that's probably what happened. Another option, of course, is that the original book of Genesis had this odd phrase and the Samaritan Pentateuch was fixing it. But why would an author of Genesis add such an odd phrase in the context of Genesis 47? It just doesn't make a lot of sense. So this was our first case study, and it dealt with what was probably an accidental change by a scribe. Our second case is actually going to be a case of an intentional change. And for this, we need to understand that Yahweh wasn't the only primary deity in ancient Israel. There was a competing deity named Baal, which in Hebrew means master or lord. We know a lot about Baal from the Hebrew Bible, but we also know a lot about Baal from ancient texts discovered at Ugarit, where we have many texts that mention the great might and power of Baal the warrior god. Now, in ancient Israel, there were many people named after Baal, but the scribes didn't necessarily like that. So let's take a look at 1 Chronicles 8.33, where we see the name of Saul's son, Ash Baal, which either means fire of Baal or perhaps the man of Baal. So the king of Israel himself was naming his son after the deity known as Baal, not the deity Yahweh. The scribes in ancient Israel didn't necessarily like this, and what they did was they changed the Baal element in these names and changed it to Boshet, which means shame. So, in a parallel text in 2 Samuel 2.10, we see that Saul's son wasn't named Ish Baal, he was named Ish Boshet, man of shame. Now, with this background information, let's go to our passage in the second book of Samuel, chapter 11. All we're going to deal with is one name, and the name was, in 2 Samuel 11.21, Avi Melech ben Yerubeshet. Avi Melech, the son of Yerubeshet. And we notice there's a little A there in the BHS, which tells us to look at the apparatus. So we go down to the bottom of the page, where we see on verse 21, there's an A. There's a nice Gothic G sign, which we know from our index means the Old Greek, the Septuagint. And instead of Yerubeshet, it has Yerobalm which in Hebrew is going to be Yerubal. And it says, see other manuscripts. And it also says to take a look at Judges 7.1 and so on and so forth. It's pointing us to Judges 7.1 because the Hebrew name Yerubal actually appears 14 times in the Hebrew Bible. And we can see him here, Yerubal, 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 Yerubal. So, some background information about the Septuagint, the Old Greek translation. The Septuagint dates to about the first few centuries before the Common Era, and it was a translation of the Jews of ancient Alexandria, and at first they translated the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and then eventually they translated the entire Hebrew Bible. The oldest complete versions of the Septuagint we have come from the year 300 to 500 of the Common Era, but we even have more ancient snippets of the Septuagint from the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves. And here we're looking at one snippet. This is called 4Q120. That means it comes from the fourth cave at Qumran. It's the 120th scroll that was published. And it's a Greek translation of the book of Leviticus. So with this information, let's return to our text, 2 Samuel 11.21. In the Masoretic text of the Leningrad Codex, we have the name Yerubeshet, which means something like shame will be great or shame will fight. Now, most mothers and fathers would not name their kid after Boshet, meaning shame. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. However, in the Greek text, we have Yeru Baal. Baal will be great, or Baal will fight. So what's probably going on here is that the original text of 2 Samuel had the name Yeru Baal. What happened? The scribes that were copying the text that would eventually become the Masoretic text changed the Baal element in the name Yerubal and made it Yerubeshet, meaning shame will be great. So in this case, the BHS apparatus is telling us that the name Yerubeshet 
was probably originally Yerubal. And the proof is the Septuagint. That does it for our case studies. I only picked two, but really I could have picked any of hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of variants throughout the Hebrew Bible. We only dealt with some very small variants, such as a Dalad and a Resh, just a letter, or even half of a name, Yerubeshet versus Yerubal, but there are some much larger cases. For example, in Joshua 21 at verse 36, there are two entire verses that were omitted from the Masoretic text. So now that I've shown you how to use the BHS, you can find many cases such as this and let me know in the comments if you find any interesting things. Also, just to note, the BHS came out in 1977, which means that it came out before all the Dead Sea Scrolls were printed and published. So, what that means is that a lot of variants that are contained in the Dead Sea Scrolls were not able to be included in the BHS. And for this reason, the Deutsche Bibelgesellschaft are coming out with a new Biblia Hebraica, a new Bible, which they call Kinta, which means the fifth in Latin. We're going to actually have a video about that Bible after we finish this series on the BHS. Now, if you want to purchase the BHS, I'll have a link to it on Amazon in the comments below. But if you go looking for it yourself, make sure you consider two things. First of all, there's a reader's edition, which is something entirely different than what I showed you here. The reader's edition is trying to teach people how to read Hebrew. It really has nothing to do with the great apparatus which we've been exploring today. Second, that index which tells you how to read the Latin in English only exists in the most recent editions. It doesn't exist in the original editions of the BHS. So if you're going to get a copy, make sure you get a new one. If you have an old copy, you can check my website, 929chapters.com, where I actually have this PDF up on my website. And finally, if you're looking to study the Septuagint or the Samaritan Pentateuch more in depth or look at some original manuscripts, you can also check my website in the section Bible links where I have a lot of helpful tools for studying the Hebrew Bible. That does it for today. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe. And also, if you have any ideas for some videos to explore in the future, let me know in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you stay tuned for the next video, which will be about how to use the Mesorah, those Masoretic notes, in the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia.